Good afternoon. Hello to our viewers. We've got a very interesting lineup for you all today during this 21st episode of the EAD webinar series. I'm Doris Obrecht. I'm talking to you from near Vienna in Austria. EAD, which is the Aus European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes, has been running this webinar series for quite a while now, since 2017. Our focus is on engaging with researchers and practitioners and all people who are interested in thinking a little bit outside of the box when it comes to development issues. We want to encourage people from all, all regions all over the world to take part as speakers or viewers in this webinar series. The title of today's webinar is Digital Work in the Global South, a Chance for Transformative Development. In this webinar, we will hear about the opportunities and limitations of economic, economic development models that build upon creating employment in information technology enabled services like, for example, call centers. We will focus especially on the Philippines and India, and maybe we'll touch Kenya as well a little bit. I would also like to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Jana Kleibert. Welcome. Thank you. She is an economic geographer. In her research, she focuses on contemporary processes of globalization, global production networks, and the social spatial um, expressions. She leads a research group at the Leibniz Institute for Research on Society and Space and teaches at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Jana, welcome again, and thank you so much for taking part in this webinar. Yes, thank you so much for the kind invitation and for having me. Before we delve into our topic, I need to give you some technical information um, and also the schedule for today. After this introduction, we will hear Jana's speech, her presentation. She will talk about 30 minutes. After that, I will ask some questions and then we have plenty of time for the debate and discussion with you. So now without any further delay, I want to give the floor to Jana to give us insights to her, into her research on the role of information technology enabled services for development. Jana, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'll try and uh, share my screen. Um, so thank you again for, for the opportunity to speak here. And um, I like to have my, my talks quite interactive and take questions in between. I'm not sure how well this works with this format. Um, but if there's any urgent questions, I believe you can raise your hands and switch on your microphones and speak directly. So if anything is unclear or there is an urgent need to interrupt, please, please do so. And otherwise, I hope we have enough time at the end of this um, to engage in a discussion. Uh, so I'm speaking to you today from Berlin and the topic is one that I've been working on over quite a long period of time, thinking about opportunities for in the title, I, I talk about digital work in the global south, but online um, transmitted work, basically, and what kind of opportunities arise from that. And generally, when we think about opportunities arising, types of work that can be relocated and employment opportunities, but also opportunities for economic transformation that arise out of this, um, the first idea is to think about technology and how technology drives these developments. Um, for me, during this corona period, I feel it's not only technology, but it's also social conventions and this kind of stepping out of uh, our sort of used behaviors um, to see actually what can be done online. So um, I guess most of you have done um, uh, online and webinars by now, um, which weren't so much part of my my day to day work before, I would say. So this is just like a, a background idea when, when we approach this topic, that um, one of the key arguments I want to make is that it's a, a moving target in terms of what kind of work um, can be relocated and can be conducted basically without physical proximity. Now, the main question I want to address is uh, what kinds of opportunities and limitations um, economic development models uh, present that focus on creating um, an economy that is based upon information technology enabled services. And if 
we move back a little bit. I think um, the idea of services being able to to actually constitute an, an economic development model isn't that old because um, this is one of the reports I found from 2004 that explicitly talks about the shift towards services. Um, this is by Anktab. Uh, and in 2004, they argued still in sort of international production networks uh, in services are still in their infancy, but they're expected to um, become much more important in the future. So services, services previously were sort of seen as a rather statistically often invisible leftover category. They were quite neglected in um, many ideas about economic transformation because they were seen to be beset with low productivity gains um, and also mostly requiring physical co-presence. Um, but we have seen a rise of uh, trade in services, um, also facilitated, of course, by global trade agreements, like the Global Agreement on Trades and Services, the GATS, um, that also regulates the cross-border delivery of services in one of its modes. And this is, this is the mode um, that we're talking about here. And this has enabled a whole range of digitally transmitted um, work, both low end and high end, low skilled and high skilled work um, that, is, that is part of the spectrum. Now, when I started working on this, there was a lot of enthusiasm about the opportunities and the hopes that this transformation revolution um, would, would bring. It was uh, called the next industrial revolution um, in a foreign affairs report by Blinders. And these are two books. Um, the first one on the left by Thomas Friedman. I'm, you're probably aware of a journalist um, who wrote something that geographers, <laughs> I'm a geographer, um, as you can see in the, in the map behind me, uh, that geographers find quite confronting the idea that the world is flat. Um, and to be fair to him, I think he's not really arguing, he has not really been arguing that the world is flat as such, neither as depicted on the, on the cover here, um, nor actually that the world is flat as he sees it, but rather what he identified was a process of flattening of the earth, um, that he also attributed uh, technology quite an important role in that, new technological opportunities, lower costs, um, digitalization, standardization, codification, unbundling um, of services and of value chains have led to a fragmentation of, of production. And so this has enabled a whole range of new opportunities in a sort of level playing field in which it doesn't matter so much anymore where you're based, um, but you can participate on more or less equal grounding. Um, in the global economy and the kind of repercussions that might have. So this was this book was published in 2005. Uh, and just to show that this idea is, is still very much out there and still very um, sort of valid um, and talked about is uh, a more recent book in 2016 by the economist Richard Baldwin, who argues um, that we do see a great convergence between the North and the South based on information technology and what he calls the new globalization. So the idea that knowledge and ideas can travel more freely now, uh, leading to, um, uh, to, more, to more opportunities independent of location in terms of competition in the global economy. So this is kind of the, the starting point that there seems to be this idea that there's all kinds of opportunities arising for uh, people, cities, regions, and countries in the global south to compete in the global economy and take on, um, refocus maybe their economic development model models. Um, I'll talk about the experiences of three cases and I try to challenge that idea somewhat. I don't want to come across as too pessimistic in this, um, but it, I think my talk is, is one way to rectify this, what I think are overly optimistic ideas and try to see then what are the challenges involved in these models. Um, now, before I go into that, there's a little bit of just terminology that I want to explain. And this is, um, 
this is one thing that, that gets misunderstood quite often. So please bear with me through this very short graph. Um, what I talk about is a geographical process of offshoring. Uh, I don't like the word particularly. Um, I'm a German native speaker, and if I translate it off the shore, I think of a coast, I think of coastlines, beaches. Um, this is not involved. However, it's the correct term for the process we talk about um, because it is identified as the question as to where production takes place, the geographical location. So we're particularly interested uh, if we want to understand opportunities for employment creation uh, in the process of offshoring. So that's why I'll talk about offshore services. Oftentimes, especially during presidential campaigns, you also hear the word outsourcing and the outsourcing industry and uh, services outsourcing. And that's a process that is different but related and can occur in combination. Um, so here you can see on the one axis, the geographical location. So the question of where does production take place in the home country? So this is based on countries, this model, or abroad. Um, with a minor complication of whether it's far abroad or close abroad, which again is very difficult to define. So just if you if you hear the word near shore, it, it means generally a country that is not very far away. Um, you can, of course, debate a bit how far far is. But let's say um, I'd be offshoring production from Germany to Poland, that would probably be classified as nearshoring, not necessarily any shores involved, but a border. Um, but if I would send work to Manila, which is one of the cases today, then that would be considered offshoring. Um, so this is like the lower end of the chart. The second question is the organizational dimension, and that is whether it is done in-house within the firm or outside of a firm by a different firm. Now, this is outsourcing. If I outsource to another firm based in Germany, it could, then it will just be classified as outsourcing. If I outsource the work to a subsidiary in the Philippines, then it's um, simply offshore, but not outsourced. And if I send the work uh, to a different firm in the Philippines, it's offshore outsourced. That may seem super complicated, but technically it's, it's very easy. And it's just an explanation of why I use the term offshoring when I talk about the process of relocation. But, but I just want to make you aware that work can be outsourced or not um, in this process. And that can make a difference if we look at global value chains. Um, of course, also these processes can be reversed. So then we talk about reshoring or backsourcing. I mentioned value chains, um, and here's one way of thinking about ITES, so information technology enabled um, value chains in services. And you can see it's quite, quite difficult to classify them. So this is, um, I think, quite a good way to do so by colleagues um, who have argued that we can think about sort of um, um, vertical activities, different types of activities, and we can think of different sectors that may use these activities, which you can see on the right hand bar. Most of what I'll talk about today is um, in the cluster of BPO, business process outsourcing. Um, and one particular element within that is uh, call centers and contact centers. But just to show you that it's quite a, quite a big spectrum of activities and they do differ in terms of the value added um, that they achieve. Um, you can see a lot of acronyms. Um, I don't think it's important to be aware of all of them. It's just to give you an, an idea. Um, and the the question then is which way is up if you think about upgrading in global value chains what would be um, the way up from a particular element uh, and maybe the cases we, we discussed today and they're also based within different elements in this in this diagram so with this as a bit of theoretical um, background to, to the processes um, we're going to look at uh, I'll take you now to, to the case study. Um, and what I think is interesting in the sector, if you think about it beyond sort of the, the messiness and the complication of all these, of all these terms, um, I think 
is, is the interesting factor that the, the whole industry is based upon cost savings. So the whole rationale of this idea is uh, to find the lowest cost possible. And this is constantly, constantly changing. Um, and Jamie Pack, another economic geographer, uh, wrote a book uh, rather recently um, that that is called Offshore, Exploring the World of Global Outsourcing. And here he argues that there's actually no settled geography. So it keeps on moving and it makes for a perpetually restless landscape. And that to me is an interesting idea um, that what will produce are probably snapshot analysis of where sectors are currently located. Um, but it means that they might not be located there forever or for a very long time but that this is an industry that's constantly pushing the boundaries of where, where we can go. Uh, and particularly important this becomes if we think about automation of processes that will reduce the labor factor within these, um, within th these value chains entirely. Um, so this, is, this means, uh, and he makes the argument, it's not necessarily only for finding the next new offshore places, but tasks might be um, sent to no shore. Um, so being fully automated at all. Um, the cases I want to present today are, um, are India, the Philippines and Kenya. And this is based on a recent paper that has come out um, together with a colleague of mine, uh, Laura Mann from the London School of Economics. I was hoping she could join us today as well. I'm not sure if she's, uh, if she's here yet um, and she might be able to take questions later. Um, but basically, so she's the expert on Kenya and has done the, the Kenya case study. And my work has been on India and the Philippines. And together we've had this very long ongoing conversation ever since we met seven years ago about our cases and what they can tell us. And, how to theorize across different cases, how to make sense of the phenomenon and the opportunities it generates beyond sort of the, the classical case of, of India. Uh, and out of this uh, came, came this joint publication that, um, that you, can, you can read if you're more interested in detail, in the details of these cases. In the article, we talk also a bit more about policies and different kinds of policies and industrial policy and I won't go too much into depth about that but I rather want to show you three very quite different experiences within the same sector and through that try to tease out some of the difficulties of these very optimistic assumptions about building an economic strategy an economic development strategy in the global south around these sectors. Now, the first example is India, and that's probably the most well-known case. Um, and here um, you can see that India started quite early in the sector and has become known for its IT sector in particular, but also for um, other services that are connected, such as business process outsourcing or knowledge process outsourcing services. And it has become almost a, in, in all interviews, in many interviews, it was referenced and it has become the shining case of opportunity um, because the number of jobs created and also the contribution to GDP in terms of export revenues has been quite substantial. Um, and we can see here in 1995, the, the types of jobs, the types of tasks being conducted out of India. Um, this is a schematic representation by colleagues, um, was rather sort of limited to IT and body shopping and programming activities. And we've seen quite a change over the time in terms of the types of services um, done from India. I won't go too much into detail here, but what I think is important to, uh, to realize and to understand is that the factors that allowed India to, to become so important in this sector or be so successful in generating employment um, 
have not only been the, the workforce and the relatively low wage, large workforce, English speaking um, as such, but there have also been historical moments that have enabled India to become such a prominent player or such an important location for these jobs at that particular moment in time. Uh, one has been the dot-com bubble that led for a lot of tech firms to um, quite a major crisis and the need to reduce costs. So new ideas for saving costs were thought up. A second thing was the, the Y2K bug. I'm not sure if you remember the scare around the year 2000 that all computers would crash because they would think they're based in the year 1900. Um, it was a major scare and then in the end not much happened um, is what, how I remembered it. Um, but in fact, a lot happened and a lot of coding work was, work was sent to India. Um, and that enabled to, to build trust and then later on for firms to also build on that experience and send more work to India. Um, and another important factor, I think, is transnational communities that played a huge role in actually uh, attracting, um, uh, gaining trust, having the contacts, having the knowledge of firms um, in the US, uh, but also elsewhere. And that enabled and organized and facilitated these processes. So by now, India has some of the biggest uh, firms in the sector and is also investing abroad quite heavily. Mm. A second case, um, then also in temporal times later, were the Philippines. And if you think about the Philippines, um, I, I brought you some of the firms active here. Um, maybe you can, you can look at them. Uh, maybe you recognize quite a few of them. Those that you probably haven't heard of if you're not studying the sector too much are those that are outsourced. So they take a number of contracts and then as a third party deliver these services to a firm and then some, um, the brand names you would recognize here, they have set up their own offices and then have used these offices to support services back to the home office basically. Um, of course, there, there's many more firms. There's quite a large number of employment generated in the sector, surprisingly large number of employment. More than 1 million workers have found um, work in the sector. And also the contribution to GDP is quite large. It's um, the second largest export revenue earner after remittances. And remittances have been a very, very strong driver of the Philippine economy. Um, and continue to, to be so. So one is migration, outward migration, um, and the other one is what you could think of as virtual migration. So you're still based in your home country, but you supply services to um, elsewhere. There's very few Philippine-owned firms in the sector. It's heavily dominated by foreign investors. Um, this um, in interviews, sometimes I was told they might develop later, but actually what happened, or no, what I thought initially was that they might develop later after some testing and some investments by multinationals. But during interviews, what I learned was that there had been quite a number of Filipino firms initially that all um, were sold. So I don't think we see a trend towards more Filipino firm ownership in the future. And that also has repercussions for uh, the amount of value capture that we can anticipate in a sector. Um, employment generation was quite large and primarily in one subsector, subsegment within the outsourcing and with the offshore service sector, um, and that is call centers. Um, that means it's work for highly educated um, young people often, so it's often college graduates who will enter the sector, most of them uh, in urban locations, primarily in Metro Manila as well. Um, and they do work the night shifts. So it has quite a huge um, 
repercussions on their social lives and also on the social life of the city if you have such a large number of people um, being employed in, uh, in night shifts. Um, this is a picture, this is a photo I took in the first um, special economic zone for business process outsourcing in the Philippines where a number of firms are located um, in Metro Manila. And you can see it's a statue for the call center workers. So the government does see them as quite an important opportunity for an economic development strategy. And they've also been called the Bagong Bayani, so the, the new heroes. So they're seen and depicted quite similarly as the overseas workers who would go abroad, often with a lot of suffering um, in quite difficult work conditions. Um, but they would send, they would sacrifice themselves for their families and for their country and sending back remittances. And a, a bit of the same rhetoric is used around the call center workers who, who are seen as the new contributors to an important economic sector. The call centers can be for all the firms we saw just here. So um, JP Morgan, for instance, might have a huge customer service center um, in the Philippines. But we can also see that some of the work uh, that is being conducted and that is offshore, it's not just work that is um, low paid, but it can also, or lower paid, I should say. Um, but it can also be work that Western societies or rich countries find uneasy to do themselves and want to get out of their minds, out of their ways. And this is um, an excellent documentary I just want to recommend for anyone who's, who's interested in watching documentaries, which is a small sub facet within the whole BPR industry. This does not um, focus on a lot of people, but it's a new phenomenon and a rising phenomenon. Um, that it's not only customer service through the telephone, but we also find that social media is important in the Philippines. And that tells you again something about the moment the sector was integrated into the global economy, uh, not the sector. So the moment the Philippines became part of delivering ITS services. And here we can see um, that it was the age when Facebook was becoming important, when other forms of social media were becoming very important. And the Philippines have been um, quite keen in developing that sector and customer support for that sector. And one element is that it's not simply customer support, but also someone uh, needs to keep the internet clean and nice. And the platforms that we look at keep them uh, yeah, safe also. So a lot of disturbing content, illegal content, um, content that focuses on violence, on graphic depictions, uh, on pornography and so on, need to be cleaned. And we tend to think this is done automatically. We tend to think there's algorithms and machines that do take on that work. And to some extent that happens. But at the end of the day, it's often the need of a person to decide whether something is art or whether or not something um, and needs to be there and is critical or whether, whether it constitutes a criminal act and is regarded offensive. So there is quite a number of people who, who do that work. And the, the film, The Cleaners, takes on the broader story uh, of this kind of work. But I just want to highlight it because I think it's interesting when we think about the diversity of work that can take place and the reasons for, for offshoring that might be broader. And the Philippines in particular have become a hub for what is called content moderation quite euphemistically for this type of very, very stressful and psychologically damaging work. The final case I want to talk about is Kenya. Um, and I think in Kenya, we could see this was like sort of, if we look at it in temporal waves of, of the sector emerging, it's the latest case. Um, and I think in Kenya, it was particularly pronounced the hopes around the arrival of the sector, around the new opportunities. 
And this was very much based on ideas of connectivity and undersea cables now offering the opportunity. Um, however, there was quite um, an underestimation of the difficulties that simple connection would not necessarily directly lead to, um, uh, to large scale employment generation uh, in the sector. And I think some of the difficulties were around the opportunity to even get contracts, so to get either foreign investors or if you as a third party offer your services to get the contracts um, that, that enables you to participate. And the second important part was that the incumbents, so Indian firms, um, but also the Philippines as the location were quite um, set already and took on the more valuable parts within the value chains and thus uh, also blocking some of the opportunities that, that might arise. In terms of contracts, um, one of uh, Laura's interviewees argued um, that, and I quote, if you get exploited, it's because you don't understand, you don't have the right skills, or you are so desperate for work, you take it on anyways. So this shows quite clearly, I think, some of the problems. So understanding the value chains and your position within them, um, having the, the required skills for a particularly high value task um, is also an important con um, precondition. But also the level of, you might know it's a bad contract and you might know you will not receive much wage at the end of it. However, um, it, it might be the only way to even get into, into the sector itself. Uh, we had difficulties in finding exact data as to the size of the sector in Kenya, but, um, and the government has been um, uh, quite supportive and also put together a number of strategies on how to put Kenya on the map for these kinds of investments. But, um, our, our data show that there was 30 to 50 firms um, with, of course, a lot more freelancers um, attached, but in no way as, as large an integration as um, India or the Philippines. And I think that can, uh, every country is specific and the temporal moments when we see engagement is specific, but I think it can highlight some of the challenges countries that want to build their strategies around, um, around the sector will face and are likely to face. Um, here again is a, is a short summary of the, of the three cases. Um, and in the, tape, in the paper, we talk more about what kinds of couplings emerge um, between the sector and foreign investors. Um, but I, I rather want to take some more time for questions. So I want to come to what might be um, what I find quite an important slide, um, which is the, the penultimate slide of this, of this talk. Um, because what we found interesting when we talked about the sector and the specific challenges, what often seemed to emerge was an idea that the countries that didn't follow India's path somehow did it wrong. There was something inherently wrong with the way they put together their strategies or they just didn't seem to be able to, to figure it out, to say it quite bluntly. And I think to me, the longer I thought about it and the more interviews I, I did, I found this hugely problematic as an assumption. And to me, I thought maybe the narratives we tell, maybe the stories we tell and the assumptions we have are quite problematic as well. And it's not the individual strategies of countries. Now, this, of course, doesn't mean there isn't strategies you can devise and there aren't smart ways of engaging with the sector. But I think we might also have narratives that make it seem like we're blaming the victims for, uh, for not being able to, to develop a sector as such. So I think one of the narratives that that tend to, to go around um, is the idea that India's success, India's way, India's model can be replicated. And I think this is 
this is not as easy and it might be impossible. Not just because it's India, but because, um, because basically most trajectories are difficult to, to recreate or to copy. And I think there's, there's a huge dependency on the positionality within the global economy um, of the social economic embeddedness and of the historical contextualization that I try to show with focusing on the different moments of change that were occurring at particular times um, as well. Much more could be said about the colonial background um, that, that enabled some of these uh, processes uh, and pre-structured them and also present obstacles, of course. Um, but just as a, as a brief, brief intervention, sort of to say, I do think these ideas of replicality are, are quite difficult. A second idea that we found quite prevalent was the idea that building your economy on services so it was, was seen as leapfrogging, so jumping from agriculture to services and kind of skip industrialization altogether, and that that would be a smart thing to do. And I think there the example of India shows us that even for, for a country that has had very large employment generation and has had the ability to um, produce some of the biggest firms in the sector and quite a large number of export revenue as well. It is difficult to build your economy just around the service sector. It, however big you grow the ITS service sector, it is still one sector in the economy and it needs to be embedded in broader strategies if you want to achieve social economic transformation. Um, and then finally, I think this is a point where I'd like to connect it to, to the base around economic development um, beyond the services sector. So the idea that connectivity is the major issue, is the major problem sort of talk we had about the digital gap or the digital divide and problems around connectivity. And I think this is also something we, we saw in the, in the sector as well. And this is not reduced to the sector. I think a lot of uh, colleagues who, who study um, African development in particular have looked at the um, uh, logistics and telecommunications. So Stefan Uma and his colleagues in a recent book on digital economies at the margins have pointed that out uh, quite strongly, but also um, colleagues who looked at the ICT revolution in Africa Padre Camodi and Jim Murphy, uh, they've also shown how the tourism sector is, uh, is not necessarily gaining from connectivity immediately, but that this always depends on the type of integration that is achieved and the type of linkages that are created. Um, so this is also something we've, we've seen here that uh, your position and the type of connection you establish um, matter a lot. Um, so bringing that together with, with a sector that is constantly shifting um, and that is defined by progressive commodification um, and knowledge concentration in, in particular firms, I think, and, and firm restructuring, I think it, it makes it highly unlikely that the, the sector will offer the same economic opportunities as manufacturing once did. So this sounds very pessimistic, but at the same time, this is just to counterbalance some, some of the highly optimistic um, studies that are, or ideas, maybe not even studies, but just ideas that do shape actions, of course, that are out there. And we've looked at sort of three quite successful cases in this regard and pointing out some of the challenges with, with the model. That doesn't mean that employment generation as such and for the individuals involved in the sector, let's say, as long as it's not content moderation, it might be, might be quite positive to them personally and it might enable quite, quite a lot of change 
at that level. But for a transitory phenomenon, um, the question is how can how can social economic transformation emerge out of that sector is is an ongoing question, I think um, that that would yeah governments and policymakers need to think quite strategically about um, in terms of where to plug in and how to then realize uh, value capture within it. Of course, there's a lot of new developments. Um, of course, automation I talked about, the platform economy I didn't talk much about, but of course is, is an important um, driver because it means it's not necessarily firms engaging anymore, but individual employees, individual freelancers um, that do uh, present another type of challenges again. Um, and then the third thing I thought about for today um, was when friends told me here in Berlin that their offices are closing and they will be closed forever, most likely. I think this is an interesting facet of uh, Twitter and then Shopify is a Canadian e-commerce um, uh, company. They were arguing that they're shutting down permanently their offices. And so I wonder, this might be another moment um, where what can be done where changes again. And um, the, the website has also already changed and they argue now we can hire you almost anywhere. And they argue the time zone might be more important than your actual physical location for being employed within a firm. So these are, these are new questions to arise. Um, and I do think they make the kind of issues we have outlined even more important in the future. Um, I'd be very happy to take questions now. And I thank you very much for attending and being there and listening. And I'm excited about yeah, the questions and discussion points you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jana, Jana for this presentation. Usually I start now with the questions, but as we already have two questions in the chat box, um, I will give you this one first. Um, I will copy the first one again to the chat box so you can read it as well. Uh, hi, Jana, could you please differ a BPO and shared service center model in outsourced corporates? Okay. Um, yes, good question. So I think it relates to the distinction between outsourcing and not outsourcing. So both are offshore. And what happens generally in business process outsourcing is that it's another company. And the interesting fact is that in the, um, in the Philippine case, this used to be American companies as well that would sort of take together a number of, um, of clients. Let's say you are, you're operating a call center and you take clients from American Express and American Airlines um, and I don't know, American Telecommunications and you service all of them together. So that would be a, a BPO because it would be outsourced. The call center would not belong to American Airlines um, or any of the others. Whereas with shared services, it basically means um, it is fully owned and it's a subsidiary set abroad, set up abroad. Um, and that often means it's not necessarily limited to a particular task. So whereas the first example was the call center now, it could be the back office for American Airlines. So it might be call centers, but it might also be um, accounting or documentation or any kind of other back office work that can be transmitted or moderating the social media channel, for instance, um, that could be outsourced through this. So it's a, it's a legal difference in a way but it often has implications for the types of tasks that are conducted. Okay, thank you very much. I hope the question is answered now. If not, please just raise again your hand or write in the chat box or just switch on your microphone. And there's another question from um, the same viewer from Romania. It, it is clear, okay, thank you. Hi, Jana. Uh, oh, that's the first one. You mentioned that call center workers are highly educated college graduates. Is there any issue of over-education among those young, highly educated employees? 
Back in the US, customer support workers supposed to have high school education level, but in Philippines, as well as in Romania, where I am, university graduates are occupying those job roles. Yes, thank you. Very, very good question. And that is something that we, we do see in the Philippines. Um, I'm not sure if over qualification or over education is the, um, how, how can I phrase it? So I think what we do see is that people have higher qualifications than they would have if the job were located in the US. But I do think it also requires a different set of skills because the emotional labor of sort of pretending you're in a different place or knowing, so a lot of call center training revolves around um, understanding American baseball and uh, looking up the, like knowing a lot of facts um, and being able to place yourself into those shoes. Uh, of a customer in a, in a different place, I think requires a different skill set also. I think if I look at the economic structure, it means that um, maybe people who have other skills that are relevant for an economy and for a country aren't used. So for instance, there is dentists who have make more money who have a higher salary in business process outsourcing jobs than they were if they were practicing um, as a dentist. So I do think there's quite a lot of problems and I think the problems um, become especially pronounced if there's no upward mobility from, from these jobs that is possible. So the question is where, where do you go from being a call center agent? Um, where, can you, where can you progress into? And so I think there's definitely a mixed match, um, mismatch between the types of skills people have and then the requirements in the call center industry. And I do think that in most countries in the global south, the level of skills of the employees will be will be much higher than what what is used for the jobs um, at home. Thank you. Are there any other questions? You can type them or ask them. Yes, there are there a few questions coming up. Um, many thanks for these great insights. What is your perspective on digital work that does not entail offshoring? In particular, I'm interested in African platforms, commissioning services within the same country, like bookings or Jumia. Um, I think this is something um, that occurred particularly in Africa was that um, domestic outsourcing occurred quite a lot. Um, so I think this is also what you're what you're referring to. So there's platforms arising. Um, okay, and just let me see. Um, so uh, I'm less familiar with with the case in in Africa, but I think these um, again talking from the economic opportunities that emerge out of it is if they are more embedded within, within a country and they lead to productivity gains in local industries, let's say, then of course there are more opportunities, maybe also for, for upgrading and for spillover effects in the economy. But it depends of course on the type of work that is being done. Uh, of course, often outsourcing is associated with more flexibility for the firms involved and generally less um, employee safety and regulation, um, such as unemployment benefits or other kinds of benefits, or minimum wages or other kinds of, um, of benefits. So I am not qualified now to talk about the specific case you, you mentioned um, with, with African platforms, but I think these are, these are two things we, or two, two ways to, to think about it. I didn't talk much about platforms, but um, it depends whether this is gig work, which is uh, then, of course, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of other questions arise in in terms of um, 
what would what would the alternative be or how was it organized previously so one case i know from uh, booking platforms but i think those were foreign booking platforms like booking.com um, that operated then in in africa i think the case study was on zanzibar and what the authors the research has found there was that first the idea was that this would lead to um, a more direct interaction between the operators of tourism services and international clients. So sort of a uh, disintermediation but, and cutting out the middleman kind of problem. But then what happened was kind of a re-intermediation and actually quite a lot of value flowing to these large platforms. So I think with platforms, they tend to centralize um, knowledge. Um, they're often quite opaque in terms of how the algorithms work and they have the opportunity to, to cut out quite a, quite a share within, uh, within the industry. So I think it, it would be really interesting to learn more from you about the case you're studying and the kinds of platforms that are involved there. It helps to meet you one day in person at the ADI events. We hope so as well that the ADI events get start um, again soon. Jan, you can type your question just in the chat box, then we will, we will ask it. And there is another one in between, which was sent directly to me from the viewer from Romania. What is your opinion on outsourced jobs in general and call center jobs in particular? Yes, I don't know if any of you has ever worked in a call center. Um, during my student days, I did. And um, I think it is what makes it hugely challenging is the repetitiveness of the task. So the level of routine, um, sort of independent of your skill level, is quite challenging. And I think also often it is a complaints <laughs> function where you where you get on a lot of the the really um, difficult conversation and angry clients and so on so i think on an individual level um i do see it for many people as as a temporary job as a job they do in between other options um and the interesting question is what happens when you when you make that your model in the economy. Um, what happens a lot um, in the Philippines is that people switch accounts. So there's this huge turnover in the industry and every year they need to hire and rehire and rehire and retrain. And the idea is that the turnover occurs because people get sort of benefits when they join a new job, you get a, you get a small item, you get an iPad or you have other, other nice features when you sign a new contract. But I think it might also be just the, the idea that you want to have another line, you want to have another customer that you, another, another segment you're servicing. Um, so as not to get very bored. So the question then for me is, how can you build an economic model on these types of services? Where can individuals move to? And where can the company how can the company move into a higher value added segment and how can skills be used um, and, and technology transfer occur or spillovers occur for the economy and i think these questions are particularly difficult with call centers to answer so these are some of the the challenges i find with it i think automation is also something i feel will hugely affect call centers. I mean, by now you often have like a pre-dial system where you, where you um, have a menu of options that is done technologically um, and not an agent. So to me, I think it's, uh, the, yeah, the question is really not so much how do I think about it personally, but just thinking of some of the challenges that are involved um, in, in the sector and then thinking smartly, uh, if you have that sector, what else can you offer? How, where can you go from there? How can you build on that expertise? Um, a question for me, can people live from the wages they get in these call centers and, and can they support their families? 
Mm. So in the cases we studied, uh, the jobs were above minimum wage mm. and they were relatively high paid within the, within the sectors and uh, within the countries or within the regions, which was also what drew people to that kind of employment. Uh, this, of course, whether they could support their entire families was often, I wouldn't be able to say, but they were often very young, early 20s, and they were often contributing to the family budget or being main breadwinners in their families, supporting siblings through school. Um, but also a lot of money was spent on consumption. So new consumption habits then emerged and next to every call center, a Starbucks opened and the prices were the, quite similar to what we find elsewhere. So I think uh, it was definitely additional income for, for young people to spend. There are two more questions. I will read out the first one just for the viewers who will um, look at the recording afterwards because they can't see the chat box. You focused on outsourcing and value job creation. Could you say a few words on the relation between outsourcing and working standards, wages, inequality? Etc. So this is hard to, to answer in general, but if we think again about the, the idea of value chains and of not conducting everything in house, of having a lean firm and then giving out the way the rest as contracts means that you're not as responsible anymore. So you, you give away the task. And that abdication of responsibility means that working conditions, arrangements around the production tend to be, um, tend to be worse. Um, and especially if that occurs over a huge, over a large geographic distance as well. Um, and you don't only have one subcontracting step, but several steps of subcontracting. So it becomes more and more blurry as to who is responsible and who is accountable to whom. And I think that makes it very difficult to change working circumstance. And I think especially in platform organized um, gig work, it becomes very difficult for, for employees to actually talk to the management or address their concerns or form a union or even feel like they're part of a larger group. So I think these are issues that make it harder to have good working conditions. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist or it's a necessity. It's just, I would say, a bit more likely. And uh, that I think is, is especially for, yeah, I think that, that we can see without generalizing too much, I hope. Before I ask the, uh, I read out the second question, the question for me is we just had a very um, difficult situation for everyone worldwide. Who in the chain, if you have um, outsourcing firms, partners, who in the chain takes responsibility for safety arrangements for staff in these countries, for example, at this moment or in the last three months? Mm. I, I wish I would have more information on the situation right now. One thought I had was that maybe a lot of the um, offshore digital labor is least affected by the breakdown of value chains because it's work that was not based on physical proximity to begin with. So I think that um, that might but, I, but that again, it differs a lot. It depends a lot on the sector. If, you're, if it's tourism related service work, I think it, it might be a different situation. Um, but I, I wouldn't be sure how, I think it would be hard to say in general terms, how, how affected um, different sectors and industries and particular locations are due to the, the COVID-19 situation. And thus, the question you pose is very difficult to answer. So who would check then or who would safeguard the standards? I mean, with 
uh, with gig work, I think in particular, where it's freelancers working from home, the question of regulation and safety standards is always very difficult to pose. But in general, these firms are all located within nation states or within special economic zones that do have authorities and that do have governments who are supposed to check on the standards um, being fulfilled. Uh, how they operate in a, in a crisis situation, of course, is, is a difficult question that I, that I can't answer. I think one thing that I maybe didn't come through. I think one thing with services is that the health hazards um, are, are less than much manufacturing work. So, I mean, you have much less uh, physical hazards, let's say, exposure to chemicals or um, other, other issues. So it's, it's um, white collar office work often. So this is different from, let's say, the textile manufacturing in Bangladesh, where, where we all have these horrid, horrid images of the Rana Plaza um, situation. So we are already a little bit over time, but we have, I, I take the second one from Jan Martin as the last question. As you know, I'm from the niche that you may call impact sourcing or fair trade outsourcing. Do you see any chance for this niche to grow similar to the rise of fair trade in traditional products such, products such as coffee, et cetera? Yeah, thank you. Um, really, really interesting to, to basically see in the future. Um, I wouldn't be able to, to say that confidently where, where this will develop. I think with fair trade, the question is always, what kind of products do people care about? So chocolate and coffee are the obvious examples, but I think getting awareness for, for services might be quite difficult, especially if it's business services that aren't delivered to, to um, the individual consumer, because I think a lot of the fair trade um, power arose through also through consumer demand and it's a strategy that targets the consumers as and their ethical consciousness rather than sort of states that that are supposed to be involved in more more strict regulation and so if we have a model where the question is what kind of services um, are delivered and how many levels of subcontracting are there and is it can the companies you, who source these services um, confidently claim that this is this is uh, like can they can they use it for their corporate social responsibility strategies in such a way that uh, they will they will draw on it? I think would be a question in terms of seeing it grow in terms of demand. I hope all your questions are answered now, looks like. We have come to the end of the webinar on digital work in the global south, a chance for transformative development. A big thanks to you, Jana, for taking this time to present your research on this webinar and helping more people to understand the realities in, this, in these countries and in these sectors. Also, thanks to anyone who joined and for all your questions and for your participation. The Yadi webinar series will go on. It will be broadcasted a few times in the next week. So look out for it on the Yadi website. It's eadi.org or on the social media channels on Facebook and Twitter. I hope we will read and see some of you again. And thank you to all and goodbye. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.